Welcome to the Ultimate Property Management Virtual Masterclass Part 2, brought to you by Real Estate Investor. Uh, today's masterclass is officially sponsored by We Connect You, developers of intelligent property management software to enable you to scale and deliver more value to your clients. We are focusing on body corporates and homeowner association managers. So we know that property management is an important factor in owning and investing in property today. Trustees, directors, owners and landlords are demanding greater value from property professionals. They require more transparent and relevant reporting. Tech-enabled workflows and online portals for increased convenience. As you guys know that today's theme is all about growing a scalable property management business. And uh, Marina said something that really struck with me right now, which she spoke and she started a, a talk about um, today's all about learning from each other and using this masterclass um, opportunity to grow knowledge in terms of running a better business. So um, th in this specific slot, we are going to be focusing on growing your pr property portfolio, when, why, and how. And um, I think the best way to talk about something like that is to speak to somebody that actually has experience in a, in a business that's growing. So to learn from somebody who's gone through this and who's in the process, um, we have, we've invited Craig who's here from WatchProp. And Craig, it's wonderful to have you with us today. And thank you so much for your time. Um, Craig, I think I've got a couple of questions for you. Just a note for everybody joining in. I think our time slot might be uh, uh, disrupted by load shedding. So uh, if we are cut off, we will log in as soon as we can uh, when generators kick in and then uh, be ready to continue. But it might happen. So uh, Craig, just have a look out, be a lookout for that. So Craig, um, as an introduction, I've got a few questions for you, all based around the topic of growth. And I know that Donnie spoke about there's a couple of property management, uh, property manager, business owners sitting out there and some of them are, can't see them growing, some are roaring to grow. And I think the, the purpose of this discussion with you is just to get some input from you from, from a business uh, owner point of view, just with regards to, to growth and the strategy behind growth. So as an introduction, I quickly want to ask you to just quickly tell us about your property management journey and then also um, just talk about the kind of growth that you've experienced in the past couple of years in your specific business. Yeah, so hi everybody. Um, I started WatchProp in 2005, but um, the years, many, many years before me, my father was a managing agent in the 1980s, 1990s. He told me not to get into management, but I didn't listen. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I moved on to Propel um, 2002 to 2005. Uh, my father at that stage was the MD of Propel and then I left to start WatchProp in 2005 and Marina Constance was part of my learning process with a sectional title. I used her book religiously from 2005 onwards so um, she, she's got the best book out there so I'm quite happy with that. Um, and then we decided to start growing organically. We, my aim was to get to 40 buildings, then we moved to 70 buildings, and then we said, um, go big or go home. And in, 19, in, in 2018, we decided it's now time. So we then launched um, purchasing portfolios, and we grew our business by about 400% in a matter of two years. So that's me in a nutshell. That's incredible. Okay, so... Um Many of the managing agents who's joined us today will probably see portfolio growth as part of their business strategy. Um, just to lay a foundation, in your experience, where you're currently sitting, is there enough opportunity in the market to actually grow your business? So we all know that security is a big issue um, in, the, in South Africa. Um, the biggest developments happen now are homeowner association and uh, body corporate. So the stock just keeps on arriving. So it's quite easy. Um, we're never going to run out of stock. And I think it's always related to service delivery. So if you've got trustees that are picky, we all know that sometimes trustees, it's a relationship thing. If the trustees change, they change the managing agent. There's opportunity there. Um, general lack of service in the industry is the, the so-called norm out there. Um, legislation is becoming very difficult. Um, the trustees don't have time to deal with all the legislation from now the Poppy Act 
Um, previously, it was health and safety, and it was CSOS. So it's almost impossible for trustees to keep up to date with all these changes. And yeah, I think it's all down to service. If you provide a good service, the opportunity is always there. Good. So uh, dealing with a lot of property managers myself, um, some say that growth for the sake of growing is, is not really a sustainable strategy. And um, so often the challenge of scalability needs to be overcome to really grow positively. And by that, I mean that to grow positively, you're actually growing in terms of profitability because ultimately you want to build a, pro a more profitable business. So growth just for the sake of growth is not really sustainable. So why would you say scalability is so important in community management specifically and from experience um, in your experience? So I think um, relationships is the key to all our businesses keep on growing and keeping on surviving. And as you grow the business, um, your labor grows because you have more portfolio managers to deal with the clients. But mm -hmm. what's important is that you obviously need to put in new systems. Um, we happen to be on the WeConnect system and you have to be able to automate your business more. Um, you need to be able to allow people to access information without having to, to make the phone call, send the email. And once all those things happen in place, it becomes a lot easier. And then your, your profitability goes up. I think the, the challenge that you always have is as you grow, the infrastructure needs to be revisited, re-looked at. And I think that's your biggest challenge is that as a business owner, your mind also has to shift and change so that you can scale to what the market wants you to do. So you can't just stay in the same way. So for me, um, you want to do more with less staff um, mm -hmm. and try not to affect your service, but your service will go up and down as you're growing at the pace we're growing. Mm. You spoke about um, having a mind shift change or maybe a, let's call it a paradigm shift. And you've seen growth in your business. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned 400%, which is phenomenal um, over the past couple of years. Um, what would you say are the skills that are required as a business owner or maybe as a team to establish a high growth environment? And why would these skills be required? So what skills do you need and um, why are these skills important to, to create a high growth environment in your business? I think as a leader, first of all, you need to, to learn and engage with people more. Um, you, you need to be able to have a good team to support you around growing the business. They need to be able to tie up to your vision. Um, I think the vision is most important that you stick to the vision. Um, I think also education is important. That the more you grow, the more you rely on other people to attend to clients' needs. So you're going to have to first train them in your vision, in where you're going, bring them on board, keep on communicating to your staff first of all so they understand where you're going. And then once they understand where you're going, it becomes a lot easier to then deal with the clients. Um, you also, from my side, is sometimes you get too busy in the day-to-day -day stuff you don't focus on the next project that you need to put in place. So systems, processes, procedures, those are all important. Um, from a, a manual, never in my life have I thought I'd create a manual for a new staff member coming on board. We now create a manual for a staff coming on board. Um, we do exit interviews to gather information from the various staff that are leaving. So those type of things you have to put in place so that you can keep a handle on a portfolio when it's this big. So you, you have to be open-minded, you have to adapt to change, and you have to look at systems, and you have to challenge the system guys to do what you need the system to do. And yeah, we've been very fortunate in that way. Fantastic, so growth is, is, a, wonderful, is, a, is a wonderful thing. Um, it shows that there's life and there's sustainability, but I'm very sure that um, it's not all all uh, scale in Rosa, as the Afrikaner would say. So, um, what have you found to be the biggest challenges to growth um, in your journey of the last uh, two to three years, and how do you overcome them? 
So what was your biggest challenges and how did you overcome those challenges? How do you overcome those challenges? Well, so, some of the challenges we're still um, trying to get over, but I think the biggest <laughs> thing is when you purchase portfolios and you bring on new business, the, the, the biggest challenge with a contract is that um, the client that you now buy um, has got no relationship with you. So that challenge is to get on board, make them excited about your brand from the beginning, and then it becomes a lot easier. Um, the culture changes. So we are used to have a so-called family business. I have eight staff members. Um, we now have 65 staff members. Um, every portfolio we get involved with has a different culture. And I think culture, which we don't really look at all the time, if the culture is right, it makes life a lot easier. So the challenge is to get the culture right. Everybody got the same, on the same wavelength. And you spend more time on team building, communication. Um, with the help of my team, I now communicate weekly to my staff on an email or a newsletter so they can see what's happening. Um, you just assume people know what's happening, but through this process I've realized that People don't always know, people don't always share, and it's better to share more information than less information. Um, mm -hmm. I think the other challenge is moving over to software. I think Marco touched on it um, earlier. I think that's intense. Um, we, we also went on a whole embargo number of years ago. We went through various software companies. We tested various software companies over a matter of two, three years to the point where you just want to go back to pastel and go into your corner. Um, but eventually we found um, the WeConnect system and they're probably the, one of the better guys or is the best out there at the moment in the sectional title industry. It does what it needs to do, automated, simple, and that makes your life a lot easier. So technology, you have to use technology. Um, you have to train your staff. Um, the trustees are challenging us for information, so you have to make it available in the cloud, online, so that they can find it at 12 o'clock in the, in the morning or freaking 10 o'clock at night. Give them the tools to be able to do their work. So I think those challenges is to change the way where we always used to feed information to trustees and owners and allow them to go get the information and, and train them to get the information. And then it becomes a bit easier. Right, sure. Okay, so um, you mentioned a bit earlier in your, one of the previous questions about um, uh, uh, processes or procedures. So from, from your experience to grow and set up a scalable business, you also need to streamline your systems and processes. How do you do this and what would you say are the keys to success? Because you, you can't just have technology, that will, that will, that's an enabler. But um, I think Marco also spoke about it in his presentation where he spoke about um, SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, or that policies and procedures. So how did you do it and how are you doing it and what would you say are the keys to success to set up and streamline those systems and processes? I think what's important is that each business is different. So what we do is um, we set up breakfast meetings with other managing agents and we share information to what they're doing, how they're doing it, how's their trustees. So we definitely do a lot of networking to first understand what's out there. Um, sure. And we definitely work with other managing agents to see how we can improve our business and uh, the entire marketplace. So for me, it's all about, I'm not an admin guy, I'm not a paper guy, but in this industry, you have to be. So like I said in the beginning, you have to create procedures uh, and policies, first of all, for your staff. So we have a, a manual now when someone starts at WatchProp. Um, we do a, a first day training on the, on the WeConnect system and on the server, just the basics of where do you find your body corporate information? I mean, you assume people just know how to click on a server and find it, but they don't. So training, unfortunately, or fortunately, is the, one of our biggest challenges. Um, and, and also, in the industry, industry 
needs education. So, so it's not just about the staff, it's about the people out there. So, so I think um, you have to have a policy, you have to stick to, unfortunately, a corporate type govern, governance style. Um, corporate is the way you have to go. Everybody knows their place, everybody knows what's expected from them. So that if something goes wrong, the next person can step in and assist when necessary. Mm. Yeah. Great. Okay, I've got I've got two questions uh, that I want to end off with. Is I think uh, a big risk related to growth in any business, but specifically as we're talking about the property management business, is that you get so tied down um, managing growth and managing um, uh, the process of growth that you easily forget about your customer. How do you guys remain customer centric and personal and keep that personal touch in the midst of, of this high growth environment? That one's, that one's a challenge. Um, I think <laughs> we believe that the clients are getting smarter. Um, sometimes they know 50% of the answer, which is a challenge for us, but, but I think it's all about trust. Um, the, the, the trustees and the owners need to understand that we're looking after the investment. Like um, Donnie said, it's the biggest investment in anybody's life. Um, we're actually asset managers and not managing agents. Um, and that's where I would like to take the industry to. But I think the client's getting smarter. We have to be able to show that we are trustworthy. And the best way to do it is, is make all our information available to our clients. And, and that's what a system can do. So for me, the system is important. Um, transparency, um, if you make a mistake, tell the trustees you made a mistake and let's fix it together. So I think it's, for me, any relationship, no matter how big or how small, any business, no matter how big or how small it is, it's all about relationships. You can't, you can't make money in this industry if people don't trust that the money's safe. I mean, we've got tens of millions of rands at our fingertips for, uh, of all the body corporates. And people need to be able to trust us with their, with their money. I also think that you have to free up the portfolio manager more. So we are working at ways to free up the portfolio manager to be able to phone the chairman on his birthday and send something, a report of some sort that needs to be dealt with on a monthly basis. So we put in systems in place. We're working with, with, with WeConnect. We're working with other service providers in the background that can make the service delivery faster, free up the portfolio manager to, to spend their days just on the relationship. Because if something goes wrong and you don't have that relationship, that's where you lose the client. And it's important for, you, for us that we keep our clients, we keep them happy, and we enjoy this business together. Fantastic. I see it's 12 o'clock, so I expect the power to go off any moment. But one last question for you, Craig. And um, have you got any last thoughts or comments that you want to leave with um, property manager, business owners sitting here listening today um, who are looking to grow their business? Any last thoughts or comments that you can give to or tips that you can give to them in terms of embarking on a growth strategy within their business? For me, I'm doing a massive drive now on education. Um, where we are going to create multiple choice questions and things like that for trustees to go through. Um, we're looking at, we provide the sectional title act in a summarized version to every chairperson um, at our AGMs. Um, we buy a few of the mystifying sectional title and we distribute that to our trustees and chairpersons and our portfolio managers. Um, so education is the first thing. People also buy an insectional title. An uh, agent, an estate agent, will just sell them a property. They don't explain what a levy is. They don't explain what an annual general meeting is. They, they, so when they buy, some people have no clue that they must pay a levy. So for me, it's key that when a new person purchasing a property in such title or in a homeowner's, that we give them a pack of some sort to give them some information of what has just hit the fan by them. So, so I think that's important. Um, pricing, people expect us to be engineers, plumbers, um, CAs. And I think if you look at the pricing that we are charging as a management fee, 
it's ridiculously low. I think it's important to understand that when my dad was in sectional title management in the 1980s, he was already charging 30 rand per unit per month in the 1980s. So if you escalate it by 5% annually, it's already about 240 rand per unit. If you escalate it by 8% annually, it's 700 rand a unit. So if we were charging 700 rand a unit, I think we'll all be excited and going crazy. But obviously the industry is not at that price point. Um, and I think the growth that we do, you cannot do it by yourself. You have to have a good team behind you. You have to have good staff. So, so one of the thoughts of when is enough enough, I think when the quality of your staff starts deteriorating, that's when is enough is enough. Um, because you can't do it alone. You need a team and you need systems. And we're there at the moment, um, but you never know. In next week, something else could go wrong and then we deal with that. But I think that, that technology, people, systems, processes, or what we need to keep our clients happy. And that's it in a nutshell. And, uh, and I just want to take out a couple of golden nuggets that you said there. The more you grow, you rely on, uh, more, more you rely on other people to attend your client needs. And I think that's such an important point that you've made there. And to be able to train your staff up to the same level of service. I think that's really some fantastic stuff. And the manual and I think the culture, I think that, that to me is also key so i think thank you for that thank you for sharing that i really think um you know today so far we've really had some fantastic knowledge and to you as well craig so thank you very much i uh i just want to quickly tell a story before i get going how did we end up talking about this topic so i was fortunate to go on a business trip not long ago to mshlanga and um staying there um visiting a few clients and in the mornings before meetings i would go for a little walk on the um on the beach and uh, I saw the signs all over the place, uh, UIPs and uh, referring to an urban improvement precinct, which fascinated me because I was so impressed with how it looks. I haven't been in Mishlanga for many, many years. And uh, the way the place looked, it just looked like a different world in terms of how clean it was and it, yeah, just different. And um, out of that, I went straight back to the office or to my computer and Googled, what is this? And that, that gave birth to this topic of, of closed, closed off areas. And we wanted to include it in today's discussion because it really is a opportunity out there for property managers. And um, I know that you've got experience in it and that's why we wanted to, to get you on board today and talk to us a little bit about it. So Vanda, thank you, thank you so much for, uh, for the time on that. And um, yeah, I want to, I want to quickly uh, start off by asking you to just tell us a bit, what is this market opportunity called closed off areas? All right, Toby, thanks very much. Um, the closed off areas, um, the closed off areas is a um, very unique new property segment that's opening up in the market, specifically in, in South Africa, and it relates all back to um, provincial and municipal bylaw legislation. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that um, there are various different seg uh, segments that's formed in terms of special rated areas, um, urban improvement districts, uh, business forums, street closures, and then there are also management associations. Um, the the um, interesting part of this is, is that every different provincial, provincial area and municipal area has municipal bylaws that actually allows for a different entity to be managed. And what is interesting is that we, for instance, got the close off areas that are managed in terms of the Gauteng Rationalizations Act of the Local Government Affairs Act of 1998. That generally governs street closures, of which our company has managed to be involved with on, on roughly about 90 street closures which have been successfully established, maintained, and implemented in the public sphere. Um, the next one, which you spoke about, is, for instance, in the Durban area, which they call the UIP, which is the Urban Improvement Precinct, and that is managed in terms of the Municipal Property Rates Act of 2004. Um, then, for instance, in Johannesburg, um, we've got uh, CID, 
which are special rated areas, and they are managed in terms of the inner city partner um, inner city uh, partnership and 1997 Gauteng City Improvement District Act. So, um, and in Pretoria now, very excitingly, in the last month, we've um, received new municipal bylaws in terms of a uh, identity or entity that we are going to create in the form of a non-profit company that is called in Gauteng the IMSD, which is also a special rated area. And that is governed in terms of the Municipal Systems Act 2000. The interesting part of this is, is that the whole model is based on a public partnership with council. And what it's all about is to uplift communities and to, to, to get um, areas in these different entities governed by these municipal bylaws to um, have main, the main objective of security, greening and cleaning. And I think that is to be what you saw in, 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 um, in the Durban area. And it's very exciting and it's a great segment and a big growing industry in our marketplace. So um, yeah, that's basically, if you can get an idea of how many different um, new um, entities are available in the market. Can I, can I ask you this, what brought about this opportunity? So this is obviously an opportunity for property managers, but what brought it about? Where did it start? No, no, um, all right. Um, it all started off by the city, broken city syndrome that um, you'd also see there was um, articles in national newspapers reflecting, uh, you know, the state of our current public areas and um, our social dilemma that we have. And this is all due to degenerative public residential areas, public and residential areas, poor urban management and, 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 in, and informal trading that's taking place. So our cultural changes and the inability of um, our municipal sector to really manage the infrastructure is where there's a very exciting um, new development. And I think we've seen municipal councils, because we work very close with the mayoral committee in 20, has come to the party to bring about new municipal bylaws to say, listen, can we with uh, public um, and, and, and industry come together to hold hands, to uplift and to um, almost um, prepare or, uh, the broken city syndrome, to get that all um, sorted in terms of legislation. So every party has a role. And due to the, this, this great need that has developed, council has allowed certain relationships to now form between public municipal council and um, the private private sector. So, so in your experience in the last um, in the last couple of years that you've been involved in this, just quickly tell us how does how does a closed off area or UIP or, or, or I know there's various um, uh, ways that it can be done, but how does it work in the in, in the world of a property manager? Okay, well, what it basically deals well, basically what it's what it boils down to is that the managing agent in a specific uh, provincial and municipal area would have to um, would have to find out exactly what um, what legislation is is necess necess necessitates their management um, model and business model. And maybe to give you an idea in terms of, for instance, um, 20 and the IMSD legislation, it would um, require the managing agent to enter into a contract with the public, members of the public, to identify public projects to uplift the area. And this would um, initiate this public-private partnership, which would enable members of public to engage with council through the managing agent or through the agent who would have to have a obligation to be a compliance officer in the sense that all the municipal bylaws, municipal bylaws actually show uh, that there is a requirement that there's got to be a separation of duties and that there must be a um, stringent set 
of requirements for the management of public funds and the interpretation and the management of the data of public, specifically now in terms of the poppy and poppy and poppy and power compliance. And specifically, yeah, we refer back to the membership um, agreement that will be um, drafted between members of the public and the um, municipal council, which will be a service level agreement. And this whole service level agreement, which is based on all these municipal bylaws that I've just mentioned in the different municipal areas, would be identified by the uh, managing agent. Um, statutory documents would have to be drafted and agreements with public. Now, this membership agreement, for instance, um, in a CID or a IMSD, um, these closed off areas are all based on a volunt voluntary association. Now, what makes this voluntary association structure, legal structure, so unique is the fact that this um, voluntary association um, was formed and replaced, in fact, um, the, the Trust Act um, previously utilized for public money and public money management. So what it does now is that they now, the municipal councils, require then the managing agent to gather data of owners in a geographical area or owners in a ward, for instance, and to get a two-thirds um, voluntary uh, uh, approval of the members to contribute to these um, uh, voluntary closures, which is a special rated area. And the objective would be that the managing agent would then gather in these management agreements, which would give the managing agent the sole mandate to ma manage and um, um, manage the funds of the public to see that projects are identified, that budgets are uh, brought to public meetings for discussions, and then to present it to council. And council then engages with the public, the private sector, to enter into the service level agreement. And the managing agent would then be in a position to then register a nonprofit company, which they would have to manage in terms of the Companies Act. And of course, there's a lot of requirements in terms of that type of management. Um, for instance, you're going to need quite a, a lot of skills. But the main objective would be to identify the legislation in your municipal area, um, identify what the requirements are of your municipal bylaw, to get your public to participate on a membership agreement, and then to enter into these service level agreements with council, and then ultimately, as I say, then manage the non-profit company in the interest of public upliftment of the of the community, improvement of public and uh, private areas by doing cleaning, greening, and security. Mm -hmm. So that, in essence, is what the managing agent would have to. Um, actually now bring into their portfolio, gain the knowledge and skill um, to actually participate in this new vibrant uh, property sector that is now emerging from municipal bylaws. Wanda, you, you, you touched on it now uh, with regards to the skills or tools that you would need. So from a property manager, manager's point of view, what, what would that skills and tools be that's required if you want to enter this market or if there's opportunities in your geographical area that you are situated in that you would need to get in place. Can you just right. talk about that a bit? All right. One of the major points that are required in terms of having the skill to manage this type of new uh, precinct mon management model, that's what we basically call it, is pre precinct mo um, um, management, would firstly be a very bespoke IT system. Um, which, uh, which assists the managing agent now to deal with huge databases. And in terms of the poppy and power compliance, it's relevant to have a highly sophisticated IT system that integrates financial and data management. 
because different from, for instance, sectional title where you receive your database from the deeds office or the land surveyor or ultimately the title deed transfers, this is a voluntary association where members of public enter into an agreement with this non-profit company to manage their public funds in the interest of the upliftment of a community. To enable the managing agent to do that, they would have to have a transparent and accurate database that reflects back to a geographical area that is managed by virtue of a zoning map. And also, if you do application to council, you have to identify the area in terms of the municipal zoning chart so that council can identify which owners fall within that um, voluntary association or CID or street closure and that would form the base of the application to council. So the data, the gathering of the data, the main maintaining of the data is a very relevant um, part of this management model for the managing agent. Further to that, the managing agent would have, have to have a strong legal base in the sense that the managing agent will be expected to be able to do corporate governance in terms of the Companies Act, specifically in terms of the requirements for non-profit companies, which is um, a little bit more different than your normal homeowners association, due to the fact that there's got to be transparency, separation of duties, um, the managing agent will be required to manage the affairs of the non-profit company based on Section 88 of the Companies Act. In other words, they would have to be able to see that these steering committees, which act on behalf of the public, would be um, notified of changes in legislation, see that they have accurate and transparent accounting principles, um, implemented and that the, um, uh, all the corporate governance are kept in such a manner that any resolutions taken, budgets approved must be of public knowledge and that they, in other words, must be able to practice stringent corporate governance in terms of non-profit companies, financial management and the Companies Act. And that would fall back to the third requirement is that you would have to be able to comply with the legal compliance. As I said, the nature of this uh, voluntary association and because of we, we're talking of really, really great, big groups of public interest, um, some of the wards can be up to between seven and a half thousand to 22,000 members in an area. Um, you would have to comply with the municipal bylaw, which I've mentioned previously, which would govern these different entities, um, because there are um, objectives set in terms of these bylaws that would guide the managing agent in the objectives of, for instance, the top-up services, which can be um, maintenance, street lights, it can even be electrical, in, for instance, in our IMSD legislation in Pretoria, um, the managing agent would have to see that, um, for, for instance, to give you an idea, our municipal top-up services in, in terms of this new IMSD legislation could be anything from portable water, sewage and wastewater treatment, electrical distribution, municipal roads, street lights, stormwater management, solid water waste disposals, public transport infrastructure, systems, capital assets, and so forth. So what councils are really doing is they are now part, um, handing over a lot of the infrastructure management to these um, volu voluntary associations, which are these precinct models. And so there would be a, a very big um, compliance requirement in terms of, for instance, the financial management and legal management in terms of the municipal bylaw, because ultimately it is the municipal council that will be giving the contractual agreement to the public, to the managing agent, to allow them to manage a municipal area, but within the bounds of legislative requirements. <music>